Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Shit You Wish Your Building Did. This is the podcast where technology experts tell you how to make your building smarter. Today, we're speaking with Nick Clark from Orchid Swanky. Why has an architectural firm acquired a smart building integrator? And will this kind of acquisition bring us closer to bridging the design operate divide in commercial buildings? Stick around for this interesting conversation with Nick. And if you're serious about making your commercial building smarter, then you're in the right place. Every episode, we talk to an expert in their field and discuss practical business advice on how to implement technology in buildings. And if you like what you hear, don't forget to like the episode. And if you subscribe to the channel, you'll be notified when we publish new content. Let's go. I'll, I'll do. Nick, welcome to podcast. Thank you. Good to be here. Great. I'm really glad you're here. And uh, I should start by saying congratulations on uh, the acquisition of your company. And I thank you. Yeah. I think a good place to start today is just tell us a little bit about uh, Orchid Swanky and uh, TFG. Sure. Um, so if we start with, with TFG, because that's uh, that's where I've sort of come from. Um, it's a company I started when I was at uni, um, and we grew it as a technology systems integrator. Um, primarily, it's an audio visual systems integrator, um, serving really two markets. Um, the uh, st our stage technology business is really venues, particularly theatres and other performance spaces. And we've got a um, sort of commercial audiovisual systems integration, so so commercial buildings, um, offices, um, healthcare settings, and so on. Um, and we uh, we've grown sort of fairly steadily, a little slower than I'd like, but the various challenges that have beset the world that we're all too familiar with. Um, and meanwhile, Orchid Swanky is the, I believe, the UK's only quoted architecture firm. So it's on the stock exchange. Um, the ticker is AUK, like the uh, like the bird. Um, and uh, so, so unlike a normal architecture practice, which is a you know, most commonly a partnership or an LLP, um, it's a public company that that, uh, that you can buy shares in, um, and the value of those go up and down in line with the performance of the business. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly haven't come across. Uh, hardly any um architectural firms that, yeah, that, it, that are publicly listed i think i'm right in saying it was kind of illegal until the 1980s and then when everything deregulated um about half a dozen uh, floated but the other five um you know had various mishaps along the way um and, and orchid is the is the one remaining that, that's using this and therefore has a a, a a a business model that's unique in the uk which i think pre prevents uh quite a lot of um opportunity and interest mm. um one of the one of the challenges in the architecture world is um grappling with a, a business model that that i think is is kind of broken really mm. in that traditionally as a partnership um if you're a retiring partner um you you are looking to be bought out of your position um and you know, take a lump sum away when you go as an owner of the partnership but and, and and when you bought in maybe 20 years before you will have borrowed a big pile of cash and stuck it in to to into the business um for your share of you know buying in and um i think the the the, the partners retiring now are looking around and and the younger generation are thinking are you kidding like why am i going to take I, I can barely get a mortgage um for a house you know, why am i going to take on a massive loan a six figure sum and pay interest on that and try and clear it as extra pressure on, on my personal finances to, to, you know, just to give you a pile of cash to go. Um, and so, uh, the interesting thing about a PLC model is that, um, it's a bit more like a, a regular business, um, as you, you might expect a, um, uh, say a, a management consultancy or, or any commercial business to be where there's, um, there's an ownership structure and you don't have to, um, pay to progress in your career mm. um, um but equally through the, the the plc model you can if you want to invest in the business um to, to share in it as it performs yeah um but i think one of the challenges there is making sure that it's a business that's going to perform and perhaps the link is that both companies are inherently project-based businesses 
Um, so you know, if you build, if you design a building, it, it's done. You don't need to design another one. It, you know, that has a, a finish. Similarly, with an AV system, if you install it or if you build a theatre, um, you know, it's not a business that has, um, I don't know, like a SaaS model where someone pays you so much a month for a continuing service. And the challenge of any project-based business is that as you grow it, you are, um, from a business perspective, you're kind of growing the machine that needs feeding. There's this mm. size to it, and at some point. That, well, you're continually grappling with a mismatch between the the resources you've got and the demand on those resources. And at the two extremes, you either run the business with um, a, a sort of skeleton staff um, and have to rely on freelancers and you lose control of the, of, of the quality of what you're doing, or you have so many full-time staff that you can't keep them occupied enough and you, you can't make a profit. And, and so you're stuck in you know, balancing balancing this but ultimately if you get bigger there's no reason inherently why the business is going to be more valuable um you just have that added risk of of, of more to more to balance really. mm. no it's a very so, interesting description i think of of those types of businesses and i guess perhaps there's also historically that's the way that it's been done right in our in the architectural space yes. and there it's carried on without perhaps people thinking about different alternatives and and again, I yes, think this I mean, brings us back to the acquisition, right? That that there are different ways of you know of of, of doing this, of of growing an architectural business or growing a systems integration business. But I mean, sure. I mean, how how did it come about in the first place? How did um, how did did they approach you about 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 so, the acquisition? So so actually, I um, I reached out. If you're on the on the uh, aim market of the stock exchange, you have a, a a nomad, which is a nominated advisor, which is essentially a financial services firm that makes sure you're following the rules as a public company. And and I approached via them, and um, they set up a meeting with the the then chief executive of Orchid Swanky, who um, and he and I went for coffee, had a chat, and uh, he was coming up to retirement, and they were considering how best to handle the succession. And uh, they they'd interviewed a few um, potential you know, potential successors, and I think it was felt that actually the the challenge is that they've got to do something different. Um, that I think from talking to some of the people who run the the the, the architecture businesses uh, in the group, um, you know, there's a feeling that that the PLC is is. I mean, at, at the moment, frankly, at, at best, irrelevant the PLC structure that that they don't see it as as an advantage um, that I think it can be and that it it needs to be because you know, running a PLC is expensive. You have to have a, a board of non-executive directors. You have to follow a load of corporate governance. You have to pay various fees to all these city people to stay listed and and so that people know things are done properly and be accountable to the outside shareholders and all that costs money. So you've got to have a reason why you're listed. Um, and uh, it, it offers tremendous potential. As I say, I think it, it offers a fix to to this problem. Um, but the missing piece is that if you stay just with architecture, um, you, know, you continue to have a business that is just growing for the sake of it. That that you if you double the size of the business, you've got twice as many people, um, and and you haven't got any more profit that adds the stability that that you need um to underpin the business it, it just becomes bigger bigger for, for, for no good reason I and mean, you spread the plc costs over over more more bodies but it's still like there, there's no, no, nothing compelling about that as an investment case mm. so really they were looking for ways to leverage their um you know the unparalleled property contacts that they've got um to 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 find a solution to that as to you know, and a, you know, how to unlock the advantage of you know, the unique advantage that Orchid Swanky has as a listed architecture practice. Yeah, exactly. And then, yep. mean, meanwhile, um, you know, TFG had um, was similarly having challenges of thinking. Well, what what do we do? Because um, you know, we have been essentially you know, moving from being purely an AV company uh, to a, to more of a master systems integrator, um, and. Yeah, you know, there's a, a yeah, you know, really there kind of following in 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 the way that a, a small number have done. Mo I think most AV systems integrators are just sticking to what they know, busy running again a project-based business, 
um, you know, focusing on paying the bills and making it all work. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are a few um, you know, people like uh, Mike Broomin at Vanty, who mm-hmm. I think you, you've interviewed in the past, oh, have, yeah. um, you know, who yeah, for years have been you know, just trying to do things differently. And you know, that, that master systems integration role um, that I think AV systems integrators are really well placed to, um, to, to occupy. But um, the, the the kind of when we looked at it, the the, the missing piece um, is, is just that it's all so siloed and and, and difficult. There's um, uh, you know, it, it doesn't all of the the, you know, the technology and um, the way it all in you know everything. All AV is all points on a network, mm-hmm. but and so is every other building system. But the systems don't really talk to each other, and the way the industry is structured, there's not really any budget um to change that there's there's a um you know a, a, a main contractor has appointed a, um you know a, a bunch of subcontractors almost exclusively on price at that point um and not given them any money to play with and by the way the main contractor also has no money to play with you know their mm. margins are, are terrible um and the system has uh, has evolved where the property developer is wanting something for the lowest cost um to generate the highest financial return and and just missing the piece that that just doesn't really work anymore um you know as, as, as the property market's mm. changed and, and that, that, that that's not what it's about even for the property owner yeah a, a great description of something that i think we've talked a fair amount about right like this um siloed approach to technology but also the whole life cycle of design operate uh, maintain and how there isn't a uh, a thread between them. So, I mean, do you see this now as an opportunity to be able to kind of bridge that design operate gap in the industry? Um, how will you approach that yeah, differently? Yeah, ab- absolutely. So, so I think the um, you know the industry kind of started with the the kind of the soft landings approach, um, uh, and and, uh, I, and I think one of the interesting developments was the um dame judith hackett's um grimfall report Mm -hmm. and the the golden thread concept that came out of that um you know where essentially the architect's vision needs to be preserved through um not just through construction but into the operation um and i think one of the examples was that if you have a um you know residential tower block and um with lots and lots of lots of units and someone decides to knock through their kitchen dining room to make an, an enlarged living space that might be fine as one flat but if that becomes a, a design trend and everyone does it before you know it you've got a building with a radically different profile in terms of preventing fire um the the, the fire breaks are, are missing compared to when the tests were run originally um and so this this golden thread is kind of essentially it's a um quite an elegant term for what is really like a digital logbook of the building mm-hmm. and a record of everything that happens to it um and it just seems obvious when um the architect designs everything and creates a, a model of the building to maintain that all the way through and and suddenly um really we see that as well as having the um the master systems integrator role um that i think tfg can fulfill you can also envisage a master systems designer role um, and downstream of the integrator, a master systems operator. Um, And potentially, uh, I think there's a case for saying that you need to, to, it's all much got to be much more joined up than it used to be. And that actually, while there's certainly scope to just try using open standards and persuade everyone, Mm -hmm. you could just create one business that will do all of those things and just see you through the entire process Mm. um and thereby capture um just make sure that the vision goes through to reality and that you have um an ongoing record of the building in use and and um you know all of the the risks that come from a building being on a network can be properly addressed Mm. um and 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 you don't miss any of anything from this sort of you know the the various gaps the design operate gap or certainly the, the design build gap and the build operate gap so do you think with with sort of the architectural practice sitting on the, the design team at the, at the design phase of that project, they'll be able then, you will also then be able to advocate for technology from the master systems integrator perspective as well. 
to bring that through. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think that if we um, if we can get that done at a much earlier stage, just get get the technology considered right at the beginning, um, then we'll be in a much better place. That, that just a, that's a more holistic approach. Just mm. feels more more natural and mm. sensible. Um, and and you know, I, I don't think we'll be able to persuade every client, but we don't have to persuade every client. We just have to persuade a handful. And my hope is that we'll then be able to demonstrate that that creates a better building that maybe costs a fraction more to build but is so much cheaper to run and so much more pleasant for the people in it um you know as an av company uh, as an av integrator we you know we've sold um you know obviously meeting room booking systems and those people make desk booking systems and um it's astonishing how mostly the desk booking systems don't talk to the hvac so the desk you know the av system knows that actually your building's only got 20 percent of people in it but the hvac system blithely heats the whole the whole building up anyway um when actually you you could uh, not only just say well it's there's only 20 percent people in so put them all on one floor and heat that mm. you could actually have the information going two ways and say well you know Actually, I like being in a 24 degree environment or, you know, my, my eight year old is still in, just been in shorts all winter and, you know, he, he, he would sooner be in an 18 degree office and, uh, you know, you, you provide scope to, to have the information going both ways and not just the, 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 the desk booking system telling the HVAC system stuff, but the HVAC system could say, well, I'm going to heat this part of the building to this temperature and mm. if someone wants that, they can be there. No, absolutely. Um, and you can just provide that much better, um, much more enjoyable um experience for more joined going to be in the building approach to automation yeah. as opposed to this siloed um, approach which you've already talked about of course yeah exactly yeah did do you i mean just obviously we've talked about the integration which is what you're used to and you can do but do you also see an opportunity for you guys to not just install the technology but but also provide it and perhaps because i mean obviously we all know that there are very good margins in software as well is that something as a public company as well you think will be you know, useful uh, to, let's say, um, solve some of the challenges you mentioned around the, the old way of doing an architectural practice? Yes, absolutely. One of the, um, one of the things investors look for is um, revenue that is recurring kind of automatically um, because uh, in a project-based business, you have to kind of... Um, keep selling in order to refresh the order in order to refresh the order book you know when you when you carry out work you destroy your order book whereas with a software business where there's some monthly fees for the service um selling is just growing the business because as long as you're providing a good service the client sticks around and continues to order the service and we had some experience of that at tfg where we invested in a small uh, media software company and helped them um to 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 sort of change the profile of, of what they were doing from from one-off software license sales to, to to a SaaS model, and the valuation rocketed, and and we sold it in three years for seven times revenue, and um, no one is paying seven times revenue for um, for for a, for a systems integrator or an architecture firm. Um, it was quite interesting uh, uh, listening to your talk with. Um, uh, uh, Jeffrey Moore from um, the the go. I mean, I, I read Crossing the Chasm when I started the business in the in the nineties. Yeah, um, and, iconic book from that era. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, yeah, fascinating to see that. That's I think that's where smart buildings are at in a lot of a lot of places. Um, and uh, uh, and yeah, that 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 that's a, a gap to be that's a gap to be crossed. So, so you know, in listening to your talk, one of the points that he that he mentioned was um, the challenges of an established company looking to buy other businesses, and that uh, you know that the, the, one of the difficulties is that as, as the established company, you might be valued at one times revenue, and this tech startup thing wants twenty times revenue, and, and actually, it's even more extreme for us. You know, we're currently valued at like a, a third of revenue. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to. One of the challenges will be finding finding the right opportunities and actually the recent um difficulties that tech have had i think presents an opportunity that, that the valuations are way lower than they were and raising capital is way harder than it was particularly for relatively small businesses so one of my main objectives is to find some small tech businesses mm -hmm. with recurring revenues with interesting 
with interesting tech, be that um, IoT devices or software sold on on a, on a SaaS model, um, and seeing if we can help them because they have um, a sort of a funding gap where they might be struggling to 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 get their next round away, um, or the valuation's lower than they wanted, and you know, we're able to offer um, you know, public company equity and. Uh, I'm hoping that there'll be scope to find quite a few opportunities like that in the in the next year or two. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, not a bad time at all to uh, think about acquiring uh, or at least helping, right, prop tech companies yeah. that um, that might have a funding gap um, given given yeah, what's I mean, been going on this year. Yeah, especially those that, that you know that have a product and just need some help taking it to market, given. That as the established, an established player, we have such good connections to and to be able to take them something diff, different, um, and interesting. I think, yeah, should be good. Yeah. What other ways are you thinking about uh, growing the business as well? So, um, so really, there's uh, although the 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 uh, there are certain rules being on the stock market which I'm getting to grips with about what you can do and you can do pretty much anything but it, it can get quite expensive in terms of the the fees can be disproportionate in terms of the rules about what you acquire when um, but if we uh, certainly we need more smart building consultants um, and they're relatively easy because that's essentially just hiring people so there are mm. no real rules around that um, for the first 12 months, um, we're kind of relatively constrained in, in terms of buying reasonably small businesses. Um, but I think there's a lot of scope to show the market the kind of thing we want to do just in, in smaller scale. Um, and that will it will include um, you know, some tech firms. Um, but I'm not averse to acquiring architecture firms where that makes sense. I think that um, architecture... Um, like so many other industries is being changed by technology and you know there are some advantages to scale and i think that the plc as i say if you can give um shareholders confidence that the share price is going to be a good store of value um then you can go to um you know architects who want to want to retire and have a business and and, and want to take some value off the table um as a public company we're able to use public equity as a way of doing that mm -hmm. Um, and we don't have to make their start, you know, their, their middle management, their, their next, you know, their second tier of management to take on some massive debt and, and sort of saddle the business or themselves with, with debt. You know, we're able to use equity instead. Um, and then, of course, the, you know, the businesses have, uh, you have the scope for organic growth. Um, it is organic growth, growth is really hard in a, in a project based business. Mm -hmm. Um, but um, uh, Veritech is one of the two architecture practices in the UK that uh, ASG own, and uh, that's an exec arch architecture firm. So it works with creative architects and then sort of delivers their vision, um, and that's growing quite, growing really quite nicely, um, and doing very well. Um, so yeah, so so it's kind of a, a mix really mm -hmm. of some acquisition of um, tech firms possibly acquisition of architects mm. organic growth particularly in architecture and um and, and and just hiring some more people to start to deliver the new services yeah well look i thanks for spending the time with us today i you know i think genuinely this is a really interesting um <clears throat> acquisition and um it's great to see companies trying new ideas and new ways of doing business and and you know disrupting um, sort of older ways of, of, of that have been more traditionally the way that that we've delivered buildings. So, I wish you yes. I wish you luck. Thank you, thank you. It's um, yeah, I'm I'm really excited. It feels like feels a bit like being a startup in the '90s again. Uh, only this time with all the tech and the people at my disposal to, yeah, to really make it happen. It's, exactly. it's gonna be an interesting time. Good stuff. If they want to find out more about Orchid Swanky or yourself, um, how could people find uh, out about that? Uh, yeah, if you look at the London Stock Exchange website, uh, AUK is the ticket you type into the search box and you can see all our news. Um, Orchid Swanky, if you put us in Google, um, or uh, TFG is tfg.com. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, and, and I'm on LinkedIn. Happy to, happy to talk to anyone who's interested in, in, in getting involved. Brilliant. Thanks again, Nick. Bye for now. Thank you.